You know, the thing about having things in common is that it connects us. And being connected is a key value in family, and relationship, right? It's, it doesn't make sense to have relationship if we don't connect. So connection is really the goal. And I really believe it's not just things we have in common, of course. It's, it's a shared value system. It's, it's really walking out shared values together. We have this saying about microchurches that are just, it's just true of life, that we all want to know and be known. We all want to love and be loved. We all want to serve and be served. And that, that's really the secret sauce of relationship. And when that's happening, when there's a mutuality to that, life is fun. Relationship is good. And um, so I want to take a few minutes, just go a little deeper about how we can do that, how we can know and be known, love and be loved, serve and be served. And the first thing is this, our everyday family relationships are a given. So we talked about the fact that you didn't get to pick your natural family. Most of the people in our group were happy about that, but there were a few that were like, yeah, I would have preferred it to be a little different. It doesn't sound very good to say that because it's almost insulting, but in some ways, not every family was perfect. They say that 90 to 95% of people grew up in a dysfunctional family. And of those dysfunctional families, some are mild, but some are more severe. And uh, it's true that you may have done better had you been in a different environment. I mean, that's just the truth. And so uh, not everybody gets to choose. Some people who, um, there are certain circumstances where you either get to choose your family or the family chooses you. But in most cases, you're born in, and uh, whatever, however you come out is how you come out, and whatever family you're in is whatever family you're in. So our family relationships are a given. And um, I think part of what life is about is learn how to adjust to that. So you, whether you liked your family or not, whether you loved it or not, your family is a given. You were born into, you were brought into a family. And in the same way, I believe God actually sets people. He places people. I think Psalm 68, 6 is actually declaring that the Lord sovereignly places, I call it sovereign joinings. I think that God is smart enough that he looks at people and he says, I want those people to walk together in this set of relationships. And there's reasons that are bigger than us why he does that. But he, I believe he actually creates the DNA of a local church. In other words, he puts the people in that he wants in. And sometimes when it's time to change churches, it doesn't mean you're a bad person or you're disgruntled. It means that the DNA, you, you know the DNA isn't working. You got in. It wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right setting. And so um, being in the right local family is a God thing. It's given to us, and the Lord sets us in. And that's what keeps us strong when waters are turbulent, when maybe you have a conflict with someone and you don't feel like showing up that Sunday because you don't want to see that person. You ever had those situations where you had a conflict with someone, then you, you see them at the grocery store and you hide on the other aisle, you know, or you go in the back or you leave real quickly? Well, we don't want to have that going on in a, in a local church, but it does. Sometimes you're in a local church and you're hiding from, you know, you're staying in the cafe because so-and-so is sitting here or there. And what we want to learn to do is really work through that. It just takes time. And so when we know that God gave us a family, we can endure some of those challenges. If we don't know that God gave us the family, we can see it as optional and we can quit anytime we feel like it, right? But I don't believe family is optional. I think it's something that God actually gives. He sets us into it, both naturally and spiritually. And our job is to really do well within that. It's to prosper within that. Does that make sense? So uh, look around, everyone. Uh, some of you may be visiting from out of town, but most of you, this is your family. Uh, there's a bunch that aren't here. It's, it's summer vacation, and there's people traveling, and so on and so forth. But we're probably at least two and a half times this size, uh, maybe three times this size, but this is our family, like the ones that are here. <laughs> and uh, my wife happens to be out of town visiting our grandkids uh, and kids, but, um, but this is our family. And really learning to embrace that fact and go, you're Sam, tell you, we're family. Then if that's the given, then we can build from there. Does that make sense? If I'm insecure about that, I probably won't build. I'll probably always, are we really family? You know, I'll, I'll never get off the ground. And so knowing that family is a given is really a foundation place for us. Secondly, every family relationship within every day and every, anyway is a godly relationship, okay? So in your natural family, you know, I, I've, I've talked to many people who missionary dated 
You know, they, they dated because they wanted to lead someone to the Lord, but then they ended up falling in love, and the person wasn't, didn't love the Lord, and so they ended up in a situation where they weren't equally yoked, if you will. They, they loved Jesus, but the person they married did not. And it ends up being a problem for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Long, it can be a problem for a long time. Uh, but the thing about it is, is when you're in a spiritual family, it has the foundation of it as a godly family. Like, this is a godly family. And it doesn't mean it's a perfect family. There's a difference between godly and perfect. But it is a godly family. And that means God is in the center. The whole reason that we even dare to call ourselves family when some of us, we, we don't have any shared blood or DNA, we don't have any shared uh, background or, or culture, the reason we call ourselves family is because God says we're family. We, we are a spiritual tribe that he's put together and he wants us to not just say we're family, but to be family. That means that you're actually my sister, Rachel, and my daughter at the same time. Like, we have that relationship. And so I believe in that relationship. I believe that relationship is first. She's not a, she, I cannot look at her as a stranger, nor can I look at any of you as a stranger because you are family. I'm family with you and you're family with me and we're family with each other. And the Lord is in the center of it. Like, we are a godly family. We have God in the middle, which means we have unlimited potential and resource in our relationship right now, which is pretty powerful, don't you think? So from now on, we no longer recognize one another according to the flesh. That doesn't, that's not a hyper-spiritual statement that we can't notice what shirt someone has on. That just means that our main way of relating isn't simply physical or material. Like, we actually... How many of you, we talked about in our group that you, there's spirit to spirit connections. How many of you know when you meet someone and you're like, you, you say like, that's a kindred spirit? Well, that's sort of a worldly term to describe what the body of Christ is meant to be like, that we need to recognize one another spiritually. So I know Hannah very little in the natural, but I know her spirit, I actually know who she is. Now, that doesn't mean that at some point we won't spend more time in the natural together. I hope we do. I hope we get to hang out. I hope we get to have dinner at some point. But that doesn't mean I can't know her. Does that make sense? Otherwise, if the church got beyond a few hundred people, you, there'd be a whole bunch of people you just didn't know. But I actually can know people spiritually because we're a godly family. Does that make sense? And so we relate to one another naturally, of course, but we relate to one another more than that. We relate to one another in the spirit. And that's why, you know, I don't know if you remember that story of Elijah, but... Um, his servant Gehazi did something that he wasn't supposed to do. Do you remember? He took some stuff he wasn't supposed to do. And, and, and the Bible says that, that Elijah said, was not my spirit with you when you were doing that? In other words, I'm so connected with you spiritually. Sometimes I'm afraid to walk in church if I have the wrong attitude because somebody's going to call me out on it without having ever talked to me about it because they know my spirit. I cannot believe that I can, I can know that I'm not doing well in my heart put on my makeup, just kidding, I don't really wear makeup, but you know, I can take my shower, do my cologne, do everything, put on a nice outfit, walk in the door with a smile and somebody can say, what's the matter? You ever had that happen? That's people knowing you by the spirit. They, they can feel, they, they know your spirit. And that's how God wants it to be. Not just so we'll always ask each other that question, but because we wanna to relate to one another spiritually. There's no room in the body of Christ to be fake because we don't have to be, because actually we know one another spiritually. Isn't that awesome? So our everyday family relationship is not only a given, it's also godly. Number three, our everyday family relationships can grow. So we asked you uh, in the groups, how, how does family help you grow? And I don't know what you came up with, but we don't start out the same way we finish. You guys, you guys remember 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, it says, not many of you were wise, noble, mighty in the flesh. Meaning, yeah, there's some smart people in here. Some of you have really high IQs, but some of us don't. Some of us have really good jobs. Some of us don't. In other words, the Lord tends to attract people who recognize their weakness. That's the point. It's not to put anybody down. It's just to say, we're not all that in a bag of chips when we start out. We're just kind of a bunch of people that don't have it all together. But then when the Lord begins to move in our midst and when we begin to interact with each other, your gift begins to help me grow. My gift begins to help you grow. We begin to edify each other and equip each other and strengthen each other and call each other out and help each other. 
And we don't end up in the same place that we started because we're a spiritual family. We can grow. And I want to just, I know you know that, but I want to say it again so that you really know it. We're not just coming together and doing church activity. We're actually growing together. Like when I'm with you, I grow. And the more you can understand that and cooperate with that, that's awesome. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says some amazing things about our growth. Number one, it says that when we come together, we need to speak the truth in love. Okay? If I'm in a relationship with you and I'm being annoying, at some point, because you love me, you're going to have to tell me you're being annoying. <laughs> That's what love requires. It requires you to speak the truth in love. It's not just high fives and patty cakes. It's speaking the truth in love. And when we speak the truth in love, here's what the Bible says. We grow. The beautiful thing about the church is that we can be honest with one another and still kind and when we're like that, we're going to grow. Number two, it says we minister to one another, and when we do so, we build each other up. So when I minister, when I serve you, um, I know, Patty, you love to prophesy because you, you, and, you and Bob value the prophetic. You value revelation. I love that about you. And so when I watch you, when you're at microchurch or when you're in here on Sundays, I watch you. I watch you guys. I watch all you guys. And I see you prophesying. I see you ministering. And what you're doing is you're not just using your gift. You're actually building somebody else up. I know you know that. But what's beautiful about that is when we operate in our gifts, we are helping somebody else grow. And so it's a win-win. You get to use what you're created for, and you help other people grow up. Isn't that awesome? And then thirdly, it says, when we come together by what every joint supplies. So when we come together in microchurches or in teams, that's the concept of a joint. It's several people coming together and something is moving. So the reason microchurches, I love what um, Richard said and Peter said. They said, the thing I love about our microchurch is you never know what's going to happen. What, what they mean by that is not that it's just unpredictable in an unsafe way. They're saying because people are coming together, the joint is supplying something different each time. There's nutrients coming together, and something is happening in the spirit realm. Does that make sense? That's awesome, you guys. That's really, really awesome. And I'm encouraged by that. So I just want to say to you that our everyday family relationships release growth. Number four, I got five of these. Number four, our everyday family relationships are gold. This is the big point tonight, all right? I guarantee you one thing, that God considers this much more valuable than you and I do. To us, it's church, it's a Wednesday night, it's a summer synergy, it's whatever. To God, this is gold. Now, you may not know that, but I want to just share with you how God sees things. We often take church for granted because we, some of us have been doing it our whole lives. Uh, we sometimes come when we feel like it. We can do, do whatever. Uh, but we ask you that question about the bar of gold is, what would you trade for gold? Like, it's, it's a real question because the scripture often compares valuable things to gold. Did you know that? I'll give you an example. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. If you will make your ear listen for wisdom, incline your heart towards understanding, uh, cry out for discernment. If you will search for it, search for wisdom, understanding, discernment as silver and gold, then you will know the fear of the Lord, and you'll have the knowledge of God and his will. How many Christians, you know, the number one search engine item for Google for Christians is knowing God's will. Christians are desperate to know God's will. The Bible says right here, if we will value his wisdom, his revelation as more valuable than gold, we'll have it. So the disconnect is that we just don't think of his wisdom as valuable as a bar of gold or two or three or four. How many bars of gold would it take you to take the devil's wisdom instead of God's? The answer ought to be, I wouldn't take, you could load up this room. I could be a gazillionaire and I would give it all for God's wisdom. Because the Bible says if we'll search for the wisdom of God like gold, like a bar of gold or two or 10 or 20, we'll have it. Does that make sense? That's one example. Here's another example. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7, God caused us to be born again. We greatly rejoice in this, even though we are distressed by various trials, knowing what? Knowing that the testing of our faith, the testing of our faith is more precious than gold. 
your faith and my faith being tested is more valuable than umpteen bars of gold. In other words, you know, when we wiggle out of tests, what we're saying is I'd rather have the bars of gold than, this, than the outcome, which is my faith. I don't care that much about my faith growing. But if we could learn to value our, our faith, the testing of our faith, because every time our faith is tested and we endure it, it grows. If we could learn to value that more than gold and say, you know what, my faith is because your faith, the Bible says without faith you cannot please God. There's nothing that doesn't happen by faith. It says everything happens by faith working through love. Like everything in the kingdom, everything in Christianity happens by faith. God created the worlds by faith. That was when there was no sin. Faith isn't just needed on this earth. Faith is the economy of the kingdom. God saw something in his heart, in his mind, and spoke it out by faith, and it, it came into existence. We're learning as Christians how to be like him. We're learning how to speak what he speaks so that when we release our faith, something happens. A lot of us haven't learned it yet, so when we release our faith, not much happens. That doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It means that our faith hasn't been tested as gold. We need to consider our faith so valuable that we would go through anything to have it strengthened. Does that make sense? Why? Because when you have faith operating, you can, anything's possible. The Bible says, have faith in God. Nothing is impossible with God. When you believe in God, anything's possible to the person who has faith, right? So your faith is so valuable that you would say, you know what? This problem is a problem, and it's not very fun, but I would take 10 of these problems if it means that my faith becomes strengthened and so I can operate in faith now because I'm not operating at the level of faith I want to operate at. I want to be able to speak to cancer and have it go. I want to be able to raise the dead. I want to be able to, right, forgive 10 times quicker than I do. I want to have the level of faith that when I pray, I absolutely know God's going to answer me. I want to have faith that my marriage relationship is going to be restored. I want to have faith that my finances are going to get stronger. I want to have faith that God is going to provide that opportunity that I need. And it's going to require the testing of our faith because as your, as your faith is tested, it becomes stronger. Does that make sense? So here's one, 2 Timothy 2.20. In God's house are vessels of silver and gold. What are we? We're vessels. It's talking about us. 1 Corinthians 3, build the house using gold, silver, and precious stones, not wood, hay, and stubble. See, we're eternal beings. We are gold. You're looking at gold all around you, so we need to build with gold. That means you need to bring your best A game when you're with the body of Christ because you've got to build with gold when you're trying to build gold. The problem with Christians in churches is that we can barely get along and stay with one another for any length of time because we don't value this right here. Like, we have to see each other as gold. We are the bars of gold. I don't know, for me, my top five were all relationships. How many of you would say, when we did that question, how many, the top five were all, there's no gold you would trade for those relationships, right? Well, this is one of, this was one of my top five right here. There's the Lord, there's my wife, there's my family, which includes my kids, my grandkids. There's you guys. They're, 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 you are the gold in my life. Like, that's it. There's no, if I get bars of gold in addition to that, awesome, but I would never trade, trade any of them for bars of gold because you are the gold. I already have the gold. If we don't see it that way, we'll give up when times are tough. We'll be flaky in our attendance and our participation because we don't see that this is the gold in life right here. Does that make sense? Last thing, last G, our everyday family relationships bring God glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God. How many of you want to bring God glory? I've, I have a teaching I've developed. It's called Glory 3.0. Some of you have heard it. I'll give it to you real quick. Glory 1.0 is the glory that exists in the natural creation. It says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The earth shows forth his handiwork. That's glory, what I call glory 1.0. It's the glory of God when you see a sunset. It's the glory in a flower. It's the glory in an animal. It's, it's, it's the beauty of creation, right? That's, that's the lowest level of glory that's on the earth that we see. It's just the glory of creation. It's not bad. It's just 1.0. 2.0 
is the glory that everyone thinks is 3.0. That's the Kabod Shekinah glory. That's the manifest presence and power of God that would happen like at the Old Testament temple dedication and, you know, when you're in a conference meeting and it's super powerful. That's what everyone is chasing right now. They think that there's no greater glory than that, but there's, that's only 2.0. It's awesome. It's just 2.0. 2.0 is the kabod, the weighty. How many of you have felt the weighty presence of God? Yeah, I have. It's knocked me over before. It's powerful. How about the, the Shekinah where it's just so bright? I was praying with a friend of mine in uh, a restaurant one time, and I, I couldn't see. And it was, the, it was the Shekinah light of God. It just blinded me. It was so powerful. And uh, so I've seen it physically, the, the, both of those. But Glory 3.0 is much greater than those first two. There we go. Enjoy 2.0. But listen up for 3.0 because this is important. 3.0 is this. Let me just tell you this. I was thinking one time where it says in Habakkuk, says the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And I thought, so is God going to release the Shekinah or the Kabod glory all over the earth? And I used to think for years and years, that's what I thought was going to happen. I had a picture in my head that the Lord would just release this awesome glory. But I don't believe that anymore. I don't think that's what he's going to do. I think he's talking about the church because Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you. See, when it's talking about the greater glory, it says the inferior glory was on Moses when he was at the burning bush. And that was glory 2.0, by the way. That was massive glory. Moses is looking at a burning bush and his face is so filled with glory that when he walks away, he has to put a veil on because people are freaked out by the amount of glory that's on his face. It says in 2 Corinthians 3 that that's fading Old Testament glory. It's inferior. So everything we're dreaming of, the ultimate outpouring that's going to have this 2.0, it's inferior. It's good. It's just inferior. The greater glory is Christ in you. It's the hope of glory. It's the Holy Spirit shining Jesus out of your pores, out of your eyeballs, releasing Christ on the earth. And it's going to be so widespread. There's going to be so many believers. It's going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let me tell you this. This is important. It's the reason I show up every day. It's the reason I do what I do. I don't do this because I'm a workaholic. I don't do it because I love the church. I do it because Paul said this. He said, for this reason I labor, Colossians 1, with all my might according to the power which mightily works within me. In other words, Paul said, I give every ounce of my being in sync with God's power to making every person mature in Christ. His whole goal was glory 3.0. He said, I'm going to present everyone Mature Christ followers, so they release Christ in them, the hope of glory. That's worth giving your life for, you guys. I know it doesn't sound very glamorous. Most of us would give our lives for a conference where we got touched with 2.0, but I want to give my life for 3.0. I want to give my life for the glory that's in you, that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm laboring to present you just like Jesus in everything that you say and do, as well as myself. I'm not saying we're there yet, but that's what I'm giving my life for. It's worth giving your life for glory 3.0. Our everyday family relationships are releasing God's glory. Does that make sense to you? Did you know that God intends to release his glory through the church? I'm talking about this thing right here. It says in Ephesians 2, it says this, we are the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. In other words, God lives. When we come together, not just in meetings and buildings, but this is a part of it. When we are together, when we're really walking together, living together, working together, one heart, one mind, one spirit, one purpose, we become, a, we become like a house. The word is oikodomi. It's a, it's a house of living stones where God dwells. God lives it says, he said in Isaiah 66, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where's the house you can build me? Are you, you think the temple's going to contain me? No way. Heaven can't contain me. Heaven is my throne. I sit on heaven. I don't, heaven doesn't contain me. I own heaven. Heaven is underneath me. He says, but to this one will I look, to the one who's humble and contrite of spirit and tremble. In other words, my attention is focused on my people. And that's where I live. Ephesians 2 says that when we come together and we do life together, we become a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 
You and I are God's house. God lives in us. He doesn't have another house. This is his house. He decided a long time ago, heaven's not good enough for me. I want people to be my house. I will live inside of my people as they come together and do life together and do ministry together. That's going to be my house. They will be my people. I will be their God. There'll be no need for light because I'll be the light in the midst of them. In the midst of them, I will live in their midst. Another scripture, I'm, I'm almost done here. Ephesians 3.10 says that God's wisdom is made known through the church to the principalities, powers, and rulers and authorities. God is revealing his plan. God is revealing his brains, his smartness, his intellect to all of creation, both angels and demons, through the church. The revelation, the greater revelation is actually coming through us. Do you get that? In other words, his glory is being released through this weak, imperfect thing called the church. That's awesome. So why am I saying all that? Jesus said this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So when it comes to the church, again, I'm not talking about just the institution. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about people. When it comes to the body of Christ expressed in localities, every day is one of those. I've pushed all my chips in the middle for glory 3.0. I've said this is what I'm going to give myself for because this is worth giving myself for. You going to give yourself for a ministry? For what? So you can have fame? So you can get a paycheck? Is that really you give your life for that? Nah. I want to give my life for the glory of God. I just happen to know that he releases his glory through this. Isn't that awesome? So when we call people to commitment, when we say, come on, we're not doing it out of some sort of duty or some sort of you should, you ought. We're doing it because this is glory 3.0. This is what God's into. 